Good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions, and the portfolio is Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letter R in the chat function during the relevant question. Uh, again, I would call for succinct questions and answers to match in order that we can get in as many members as possible. I call question number one, Donald Cameron. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on Scotland's census 2022. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson. Presiding officer, uh, as of this morning, the return rate stands at 85.7% with the enumeration of 2,238,784 households. This is an increase of 6.5 percentage points since the start of the extension period on 1 May and amounts to 144,431 extra households being enumerated. The geographical return rate is also encouraging, with 25 of Scotland's 32 local authorities passing the 85% milestone, and a further five have passed 80%. Field force enumerators continue to visit households yet to complete the 2022 census. So far, there have been 1.59 million households visited, where help is offered to complete the census, either online or with a paper copy. This work continues. The number of households yet to return their census form stands at 373,701. All have been written to a number of times, and the majority have had a visit from enumerators. In recent days, a final reminder communication has been sent to all of these households. Donald Cameron. It is evident that the census will not achieve the uptake levels necessary for it to be successful. Before the census, the NRS said that there must be a person response rate of at least 94 per cent, and it is clear this won't now be achieved. Especially worrying is the situation in Glasgow, our largest city. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why has the SNP government got this so badly wrong, and does he see merit in an independent inquiry into the shambles? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to, to confirm to, to Donald Cameron that the most significant increase that there has been in the census extension period has been in the city of Glasgow, and more work is underway. And I would encourage him and all other members to take the opportunity, now that they have it, and the public's ear, to encourage everybody to take part. Householders have until the end of May to submit their census return. Our absolute priority is to support and enable those uh, who have not yet done so to complete their census return, adding to the over 2.2 million households across Scotland that have already done so. For those who have yet to complete the census, help and support is available via the website census.gov.scot or by calling the free helpline on 0800 030 8308 and field teams who have carried out more than 1.5 million doorsteps visits will continue to support people to complete their uh, census returns. A supplementary, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy Officer. I won't be alone having been impressed with the extent of the promotional campaign for the Census in preceding months. Can the Cabinet Secretary elaborate on what further targeted campaigning has taken place since the strategic decision to extend the Census deadline to the end of May? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Throughout the Census collection extension period, there has been a range of work undertaken to increase the return rate. The marketing campaign was extended with updated messaging informing people of the extension and reminding them of their legal requirement to fill in the Census. This updated messaging was featured across television, radio and the press. Updated digital and outdoor adverts were targeted to those local authorities with lower return rates to encourage completion, while media partnerships have taken place to increase return rates amongst those young people living away from home. Field events have taken place across the country to support people to complete their census, with events being held at places of worship, universities, colleges, supermarkets, libraries and leisure centres. These events will continue this week and into the weekend. Additionally, a quarter of a million postcards and more than 400,000 reminder letters have been sent to households who have not yet completed the census. I call question number two, Gillian Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government how Historic Environment Scotland ensures that communities are adequately consulted when considering whether a building should be listed. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Questions regarding the day-to-day -day operational matters regarding, uh, relating to Historic Environment Scotland's designation process are best answered directly by Historic Environment Scotland. However, I can 
confirm that when uh, HES assesses applications for designations, community engagement is a key part of the assessment. It does not make these decisions behind closed doors. It consults with those directly affected, including owners, occupiers and local planning authorities, and it also welcomes views from members of the public through its historic environment portal. Jillian Mackay. A number of constituents have contacted me in despair at the news that Historic Environment Scotland is currently considering whether Cumbernauld Town Centre should be a listed building. Just as it looked like plans to redevelop the site were progressing, that there was an opportunity to replace the current town centre with something fit for a town the size of Cumbernauld, this proposal threatens those plans. Can the Minister, can the minister assure me and my constituents that Historic Environment Scotland will not approve a proposal to list this awful building if it, put if it puts plans to develop a modern and accessible town centre at risk? Minister. President, officer, I thank Julie Mackay. Um, for her interest, her constituents' interest, and uh, for bringing this issue to the Chamber today. And I note our colleague uh, Jamie Hepburn um, has similarly had a lot of correspondence on this issue and is engaged as Jilly Mackay is. Uh, I understand the strength of feeling there is in Cumbernauld on the, and the way that she has articulated it. Um, however, the Historic uh, Environment Scotland Act 2014 delegated the responsibility for compiling or approving lists of buildings of special architectural or historic interest to Historic Environment Scotland. Appeals against uh, the decisions of Historic Environment Scotland to list buildings are made to the Scottish Ministers. So, as Ministers may have a, a future role in the decision making process, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the merits of any proposed listing. However, I would ask uh, Gillian Mackay to note that being listed does not necessarily prevent development or the altercation uh, of a building. And I would again encourage uh, Gillian Mackay, uh, colleagues, and uh, constituents to engage uh, with Historic Environment Scotland in this process. And supplementary, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When I met with Historic Environment Scotland in March, they informed me that 200 sites across Scotland are shut or have restricted access. How does HES intend to fund any reconstruction work in sites that require further intervention? Minister. I, I, I thank Sharon Darry for that question. It is an issue that I have engaged with the management of uh, Historic Environment Scotland on a, a regular basis regarding the high-level masonry issues that there are uh, at sites across uh, Scotland. It is slightly uh, tangential from the uh, listing process, but it is something that I have been able to uh, engage with his uh, on a regular basis, visiting uh, Lynnlithgow Palace, visiting Dumbarton Castle, or Broth Abbey, uh, to be able to see for myself the work that is ongoing already. I am uh, hopeful uh, that the process of assessment can be carried out as quickly as possible, uh, so that uh, visitors and staff of uh, Historic Environment Scotland sites are able to enjoy those uh, sites safely, uh, as we would all expect them to do so. Question number three, Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the potential impact on Scotland of the UK Government's reported plans to unilaterally change the Northern Ireland Protocol. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government has made its views clear to the UK Government. We are deeply concerned about the UK Government's plans to override the protocol unilaterally and the catastrophic damage that this could cause to Scotland. Kate Forbes and I have written to the Chancellor and to the Foreign Secretary, respectively, calling on the UK Government to re-engage with our EU partners constructively. We have received no reply, and we have had no meaningful discussions with the UK Government on this. The UK Government's threats to breach an international treaty, signed in good faith just two years ago, could spark a trade war with disastrous economic consequences for Scotland and for all parts of the UK. For the UK Government to even contemplate such reckless action in the midst of a cost of living crisis is unthinkable and it is indefensible. Emma Roddy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. If the UK Government will not listen to the Scottish Government, the Irish Government, the First Minister designate of Northern Ireland, the European Commission and many, many more who would suffer in a Tory-made UK-EU war, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that the UK Government might instead listen to the US House of Representatives, which, in a joint statement with the European Parliament last weekend, concluded renegotiating the protocol is not an option, only joint solutions will work? Cabinet Secretary. The deterioration of the dispute over the Northern Ireland Protocol, such that it necessitates an intervention by Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, and by Richard Neal, the leader of the US Congressional delegation that has been in, in Europe this week, is a grave cause for concern. The prospect of a trade deal between the UK 
uh, and the United States is clearly going to recede rapidly if the UK government maintains its reckless attitudes to negotiations with the European Union. And far from identifying the benefits of Brexit, the UK government seems determined to seize upon every imaginable harm that can be extracted from Brexit. We can only hope the UK government will indeed listen to our US partners, pull back from its irresponsible threats, and focus instead on dialogue with our EU partners and finding a durable, agreed solution. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Yeah, last April, the First Minister claimed the Northern Ireland Protocol was a template for an independent Scotland in the EU. Last week, she warned it could trigger a trade war with the EU and tip the UK into recession. What is the Government's view this week? Government Secretary. I am sorry, I do not think Willie Rennie actually understands what the Northern Ireland Protocol is. What we are talking about is the UK Government breaching yes. the Northern Ireland Protocol. Having said it was oven ready and having said that it was a fantastic deal, it is the UK Government that is unilaterally threatening to break international law. I am surprised Willie Rennie does not know that. He should know it. And there is a world of difference between that and a Northern Ireland Protocol agreed by both sides, which could be workable if the UK Government was prepared to live up to its international treaty obligations. Question number four, not lodged. Question number five, Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its super sponsor scheme takes account of the preferences of Ukrainian refugees regarding settlement locations within Scotland. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The super sponsor scheme is designed to provide a quick and safe route for displaced people from Ukraine to come to a place of sanctuary by removing the need for applicants to be matched to an individual sponsor prior to being given permission uh, to travel to the UK. Once people have arrived, a national matching service delivered by uh, COSLA will match those settling here with longer-term accommodation across Scotland. Displaced people from Ukraine are asked to complete a short questionnaire that captures key information and preferences. This information is then used to find suitable longer-term accommodation, which will be offered as a choice. All 32 of our local authorities are taking part in this programme, and hosts have offered up their homes right across the country. The National Matching Service will ensure that people are offered settlement opportunities across Scotland, recognising that people will have different preferences and available housing is limited in some authorities. Miles Briggs. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? But there is growing concern over what seems to be an over-bureaucratic system which has been put in place and the adoption of what seems to be the Syrian and Afghanistan resettlement scheme model to 32 local council areas and how this is now being administered for Syrian refugees. I understand that there are currently 1,000 Ukrainians who are living in hotels who have had no clarification provided around the matching process for this scheme. So can I ask the, man, uh, the Minister what consideration is now being given to a, a single scheme which can be delivered um, and break down that process beyond councils having to decide? And what advice is also being provided um, to councils on this to make sure this is speeded up? Minister. On the last point, uh, I absolutely agree with Miles Briggs that we need a process that um, is moving as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm uh, working uh, with officials, with local authority partners, uh, to ensure that we are in a process of making sure that people are allocated longer-term accommodation, matched to accommodation uh, as quickly as possible, and the necessary safeguarding checks uh, are carried out as quickly as possible, both to the properties that have been offered uh, and the individuals uh, who are offered them, as I'm sure Miles Briggs would expect. Um, in terms of the numbers that uh, Miles Briggs has quoted, I don't recognise them, but I'd be happy uh, to meet with Miles Briggs to discuss the process that, is, that goes through um, uh, regarding the matching process to ensure that we're able to offer people uh, sustainable longer-term accommodation as quickly as possible to relieve uh, undoubted pressures, such as there are in Edinburgh, where Miles Briggs obviously represents, uh, which has become a national hub for, for arrivals, to ensure that we're able to have a good flow uh, going through the system. Question number six, Joe Fitzpatrick, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what services the £10,500 tariff provided by the UK Government to local authorities for displaced Ukrainians arriving under the sponsorship scheme is expected to cover. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The £10,500 tariff is designed to support local authorities to meet all their associated costs, including 
providing education, advice and referrals to specialist public health services, including mental health services and adult social care, supporting uh, to access employability support and social security, homelessness assistance and community integration through provision of translation services, community events and signposting to further support. The £10,500 tariff is paid per person, but only for those who have settled under the Homes for Ukraine sponsorship, which includes the Super Sponsor Scheme, not for those under the Family Sponsorship Scheme. And from this one payment, uh, from this one payment the £200 emergency payment for guests is also paid. Joe Fitzpatrick. Obviously, in addition to the costs that the, the Minister mentioned, there is also uh, health costs which don't appear to be covered. To me, it doesn't seem enough to cover what services will be required to spend. And it is ridiculous to hear from the Minister that there is no money made available at all for those settling here under the family scheme. Does the Minister agree with me that the tariff is not adequate, that the UK Government should increase it so that local authorities are suitably reimbursed, and that this should be for all displaced Ukrainians, no matter what scheme they arrive through? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank Joe Fitzpatrick for his question. I absolutely agree uh, that the tariff is, is not adequate for the support of our public services uh, are and uh, will provide, uh, public service providers will uh, provide as we support displaced people from Ukraine, nor is there specific uh, additional funding for NHS services, a point that I have made to UK ministers repeatedly. There is no funding at all for those uh, uh, arriving under the family scheme, and that is clearly not acceptable. Our local authorities and public services will be supporting people regardless of the route by which they are arriving, and funding must be provided for them to do this, a point that I will be raising with UK ministers again, I, I know with support of Welsh colleagues uh, in uh, trilateral meetings uh, this afternoon. Uh, I have repeatedly called for the UK Government to provide parity of funding and to uh, consider the resources that are needed to fund public services and to provide clarity on how long they will be available for. And in the meantime, the Scottish Government has provided local authorities with significant uh, funding support in addition to the UK Government funding to allow uh, local authorities to quickly make accommodation available for people requiring longer term support. Supplementary, Siobhan Prime. Officer, can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government are giving specialised support and aid to disabled Ukrainians similar to Northern Ireland? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I thank Siobhan Brown. All those uh, arriving from Ukraine will have full access to NHS services and Social Security on the same basis as people ordinarily living in Scotland. This means those fleeing war in Ukraine will have access to any support they need within our health service, as well as immediate access to social security benefits such as the child and adult disability payments. In addition, a public protection response has been adopted across Scotland to ensure vulnerable people displaced from Ukraine are protected and have access to the same supports and safeguards as any other vulnerable person under Scottish jurisdiction. Question number seven, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of Scotland's Welcome Hubs for Ukraine refugees. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The Welcome Hubs have been established at key entry points, Edinburgh Airport, Glasgow City and Airport and Cairn Ryan Port. Uh, they continue to provide support from healthcare to translation services, clothes and food to temporary accommodation and trauma support. Multi-agency teams at our Welcome Hubs have triaged more than 1,500 people to date and are assessing people's needs on arrival. They are a single point where we can triage and support people. We are continually working with our national and local partners, including local government and the Scottish Refugee Council, to improve and streamline our approach. And I take this opportunity to thank all of those uh, involved in our Welcome Hubs for the incredible work that they are doing. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that response. Not all arrivals pass through the Welcome Hubs, Minister. These hubs are the point of contact for arrivals or offer uh, them support such as language support, healthcare, food and clothing. But can I ask the Minister what steps are being taken to make sure that new arrivals who do not use the Welcome Hubs uh, so that they are not neglected and that they are not uh, supported in a way for those who actually do go through the hubs? Minister. Thank you. I thank Alexander Stewart for, for the important point that he has made. It is absolutely the case. The Scottish Government is working with our local authority partners to uh, provide support and services for all arrivals from Ukraine. Multi-agency teams uh, working within the hubs are ready to provide support from healthcare to translation, as I have already set out. But we remain focused on providing a safe and secure place to address any immediate well-being and safeguarding needs for displaced persons, and will continue to do so. And if he has particular issues in the area that he represents uh, regarding ensuring that there is proper contact made, then I would be 
happy to ensure that that can be taken up with local authorities. And supplementary, Alistair Allen. Uh, staff at Scotland's welcome hubs are becoming more experienced by the day as they assist in triaging displaced people from Ukraine. Um, can the Minister assure Parliament that uh, these hubs will continue to be supported in that triaging role uh, and allowing a, a warm Scots welcome to be afforded to all those displaced Ukrainians arriving in Scotland? Minister. Yes, absolutely. And I thank Alistair Allen for giving me the opportunity to thank uh, our teams in our welcome hubs. They uh, have been moving at pace, have been needing to work uh, to an increasing uh, scale and uh, to ensure that they are meeting the needs of those arriving uh, from uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's very much appreciated, uh, both by uh, the Scottish Government, the people of Scotland, but also uh, by people who have arrived from Ukraine. Having that warm Scottish welcome that's been fed back to me uh, has been very much appreciated, uh, and I'm sure that um, we'll make sure that we continue to support that approach uh, so that people arriving here get the sanctuary and support that they need and deserve. Question number eight, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it's carried out of the specific risk to female refugees who are fleeing Ukraine to settle in Scotland. Minister. Uh, anyone uh, meeting the UK Government eligibility criteria can apply to sponsor a displaced person through Homes for Ukraine, which does mean there are safeguarding risks inherent in the system, with bo which both I and the Welsh Government have raised uh, on a number of occasions uh, with UK ministers. I have urged them to rep replicate the super sponsor schemes of our governments. The super sponsor scheme means that disclosure checks are done in advance of guests being placed with hosts. We also have guidance that supports all operational partners involved in safeguarding to identify and respond to risk and need for displaced people from Ukraine. Ruth McGuire. Thank the Minister for that answer. Um, active safeguarding is, of course, extremely important, and I understand that Tara and Just Right Scotland have produced a leaflet in Ukrainian and Russian explaining the risks of trafficking to women. Recognising that vulnerability can increase over time, um, will the Scottish Government consider including violence against women and girls partnerships and services in responses at both strategic and operational levels and commit to carry out gender-specific risk and safety planning, not just at entry, but in the medium and long term also? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank Ruth Maguire, uh, particularly in her role as the chair of the cross-party group, for uh, her question uh, in this regard, and absolutely will, will happily consider the suggestions that she has made. Uh, safeguarding measures we have put in place are imperative to ensuring that we are able to provide the necessary protection that, we, that would be expected. We must ensure that Scotland provides a place of safety and sanctuary. The guidance that um, I have mentioned uh, has been developed with expert partners and draws on intelligence regarding the vulnerabilities of certain groups, including women and girls, as, as identified through the uh, UN Refugee Agency and the Scottish Refugee Council and Zero Toler Tolerance. The biggest risk factor that I can see uh, at the moment, President Officer, is the fact that there is still a need in some areas for private matching, and the informal social media private matching that is ongoing at the moment provides the biggest risk. The easiest way to stop that is to have a statutory matching service in place, as we have in the Scottish and Welsh super sponsor schemes, and I would encourage the UK Government to follow that lead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on constitution, external affairs and culture. There will be a very brief pause to allow frontbench teams to change positions, should they wish. Thank you.